Hello, hi everyone. Good evening. Uh, I have two pieces of news, one bad and one terrific. The bad news, well, this is the last talk of the event, but the terrific news is that we have the huge satisfaction of receiving Professor Haja Halvani. Haja Halvani is Professor of Philosophy in the Department, uh, Department of Liberal Arts at the School of the Art of the Institute of Chicago. He has a BA in economics from the American University of Beirut and a PhD in philosophy by Syracuse University. He is the author or editor of several books, including Virtuous Liations, Care, Love, Sex, and Virtual Ethics, Sex and Ethics, Essays on Sexuality, Virtue, and the Good Life, Queer Philosophy, Presentations of the Society for Lesbian and Gay Philosophy, the Philosopher of Sex, Contemporary Readings, and Philosopher of Love, Sex, and Marriage, an Introduction. He is specialized in the philosophy of sex and love, moral, social, and political philosophy, and philosophy of art. Just to arouse your curiosity, I have selected some questions that appear in the introduction of the book, Philosopher of Love, Sex, and Marriage. Some of them say it's like that. Thus, uh, romantic love differ in important ways from other types of love, such as love between parent and child, love between friends or siblings. Can we define sex and sexual activity? Why is the same behavior in one context sexual, but in another context non-sexual? Does marriage have a purpose or a few purpose that is universal, not bound to culture and time? Is romantic love necessary or needed for someone to lead a good, flourished life. What is good sex and what is bad sex? What are the different criteria, morality, naturalness, and pleasure we can use to evaluate sex? Well, I believe this sample is enough to recommend reading Professor Halvan's book for the audience of this event. We will have about one hour for the talk and 30 minutes at the end for Q&A section. Once again, we thank you for joining us today, Professor Halvani, and we are really, really very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for having me at this event. So I'm going to be uh, talking today, I'm going to be giving a pre presentation today on, on, on love and moral integrity. Um, I'm going to be reading my paper. Hopefully um, it will not be too boring. I think the topic is very interesting, and I look forward to the questions at the end. So um, love and morality have various interesting connections, both conceptual and causal connections. For example, love might be conceptually tied to well-being in that for X to love Y, X must be concerned for Y's well-being for its own sake. Another example of a connection between love and morality is whether to act from love is to act from reasons of love or whether from reasons of morality, but in the context of love. This is, there is a huge debate among, uh, about this question in philosophy. A third example of a connection between love and morality is whether love is a virtue of sorts. Um, a fourth example is that people often love others on the basis of their moral properties. But my focus in this paper is on a different kind of connection between love and morality, which is the relationship between <clears throat> love and integrity, specifically on the conditions under which love and integrity might conflict with each other. I will argue that <clears throat> given specific features of love and of integrity, the two can conflict when five conditions are met. First, the lover's integrity tracks real and worthwhile values. The values reflected in the lover's integrity are important to the lover. The beloved has values contrary to those of the lover's integrity. And uh, sorry, the beloved acts on these values. And finally, the lover cannot justify the beloved's values. Of course, I will say more about these conditions. I just wanted to mention them now very quickly. I will argue that the presence of all five is sufficient for a genuine clash between the lover's integrity and the love. Um, so what I will do is I will first give a plausible conception of moral integrity, and then I will um, lay out, explain some features, some moral features of love that I get from the literature on the subject. And then I provide two detailed examples of potential conflicts between love and integrity explaining the conditions under which such conflicts can happen. And then I discuss what I call mistaken integrities 
And finally, I conclude with some remarks about the actual frequency of such conflicts and what these frequencies might imply for the philosophical arguments of my presentation. My focus throughout the presentation is on the kind of love that has the features I, dis I will soon discuss, um, mostly exemplified by romantic love or sexual love or erotic love, if you want to call it, and close friendships, which can be between siblings, uh, parents and children, and of course, between regular friends. For the sake of brevity, I will um, use the terms lover and beloved to refer to the parties in all these relationships. <coughs> So I'm going to start with a, a conception of integrity that, um, that borrows from the different discussions of it offered in the literature on integrity. So integrity, as Lynn McFall in an essay from 1987, which is a very famous essay called Integrity, integrity, as Lynn McFall argues, involves at least three kinds of coherence, each of which is necessary for having integrity. The first kind of coherence is um, among a person's principles, commitments, and values. Um, the second is between someone's principles and their actions. And the third is uh, among someone's motives, principles, and actions. To illustrate the differences between the three, consider the first. Um, suppose that Juan is committed to the principle of not causing harm. Then if he has integrity, that would require coherence. It would require coherence between this commitment and his other commitments. So for example, if he is a hunter, um, then one of the two commitments need to yield to the other or to be revised because there is a conflict between them. Now, consider the second form of coherence, which is that integrity requires coherence between Juan's value of not, of not harming and his actions. So Juan must refrain, for example, from killing animals sin since this causes harm to them. And finally, consider the third kind of coherence, which is that Juan's motives for what he does should cohere with his commitments. So he should, he should not refrain from hunting or killing animals just to show his friends that he is good and virtuous. He should, he should not kill animals because he should be motivated by the value of not harming them itself, basically. As Lynn McFall puts it, quote, if one values not just honesty, but honesty for its own sake, then honesty motivated by self-interest is not enough for integrity, end of quote. The, these three kinds of coherence among the agent's values, actions, and motives are internal to the agent which might not be enough for integrity if integrity is also about which values the agent adopts. <clears throat> so for example, we cannot with a straight face or seriously say that some things uh, say the following things about integrity. And I, here I'm quoting again from Lynn McFall. Sally is a person of principle because she pursues pleasure all the time. Or quote, Harold demonstrates great integrity in his single-minded pursuit of approval, other people's approval. And third, another quote, John was a man of uncommon integrity. He let nothing, not friendship, not justice, not truth, stand in the way of his amassment of wealth. End of quote. The idea that McFall is trying to bring up, to bring out here, is that there are particular things like pleasure, wealth, approval, money, status, personal gain in general, even safety sometimes, that people with integrity will resist. So it is difficult to think of integrity's values as reflecting them. Something other than those things must be at stake for the person if she is to have integrity. Someone, for example, who is committed to seeking pleasure might resist the temptation to yield to it on a particular occasion, but this is not enough to show that she has integrity, because having integrity is not just about resisting temptation, but also about why someone resists the temptation, for the sake of which values. So typically, those things for which people with integrity stand are moral. People with integrity are not willing to do just anything if the action is unjust, um, if it is harmful to the innocent, or if it betrays a spouse or a friend. In other words, integrity involves a commitment not just to any value or principle, but to moral ones. And I know there is a big discussion about this in the philosophical literature. A lot of people would disagree with this, but I, uh, I think that they're, they're mistaken about this. Moreover, people with integrity often stand up or speak out for what is worthwhile which can be done passively or actively. For example, um, you, can, you, can, you can stand up passively for integrity by refusing to do certain things, by refusing, for example, to sign a petition that makes outrageous demands or refusing to join a mob that wants to cancel someone. Um, <clears throat> the, an, an example of standing up for integrity in an active way is, is going beyond this refusal to do something and acting in particular ways. For example, to speak out against the petition that is being circulated or to stand up to the mob that is trying to cancel someone. 
This discussion of integrity, especially in its active role, brings out the important point that integrity has both personal and social aspects. Um, as the philosopher Shesha Calhoun uh, argues, quote, integrity seems tightly connected to viewing oneself as a member of an evaluating community and to caring about what that community endorses. This social, uh, end of quote, this social aspect of integrity explains why we regard hypocrites as not having integrity. They lack it not because, or not only because they show lack of coherence between what they avow and what they do, but because they mislead others. This is because when we act with integrity, we affirm before others what we believe about worthwhile matters, matters of worth to ourselves as fellow co-deliberators, as Calhoun puts it. Um, <clears throat> integrity then involves uh, the following things. This is, I'm summarizing the discussion so far. Uh, it involves coherence among one's values, actions, and motives, such that the values reflect worthwhile things and are typically moral in nature. Moreover, because integrity is not always a matter of not dirtying one's hands, but also actively standing up for what one believes in, integrity has a social dimension to it, signaling the importance of speaking our minds among and with our fellow uh, co-deliberators or our fellow people. One additional feature to, of integrity that I would like to mention is the importance to the agent, to the person, of the values that his integrity reflects. People's moral values can be about many subjects, not all of which have priority to them. For example, Andrea might care about criminal justice reform in the United States, but the issue of universal health care is what resonates with her the most. It is, the, it is this issue about which she enters into heated debates with others on the basis of which she votes for politicians, and that might act as a deal breaker as far as whom she is willing to date or be, become friends with. Moreover, although someone can have can have integrity about issues that are not very important to the person, um, that person's integrity typically is about values that are very important to her, as is the case with Andrea's concern about universal health care. So integrity reflects not just any person's values, but her core values, those that are part of her moral identity, if we want to use the word, if we want to use the word identity. So given these features of integrity, people can have mistaken integrities. Um, beyond internal coherence, one's integrity can reflect non-moral values, if we assume that integrity is about moral questions, or superficial moral values. In addition, someone can be wrong to care about some worthwhile values more than others in a given context. In such cases, when someone perceives threats to one's integrity, one's perception might be mistaken. I'm going to say more about mistaken integrities later on in the presentation. So now I'm going to turn to four features of love that um, along with, the, with this conception of integrity can give rise to conflicts between love and integrity. So here are the four features of love. Um, <clears throat> the first is the openness and willingness to be changed by one's beloved. This is called by, in the literature, uh, mutual drawing. So this idea was defended by the philosophers Dean Cocking and Jeanette Kennett, and more recently by Dirk Baltzley and Kennett. Mutual drawing involves two aspects, two things. First, lovers are motivated and have reason to do things, to develop new interests, and to be open to new ideas and beliefs on each other's recommendations. Second, lovers are open and willing to see themselves the way their beloveds or friends see them. The nature of love, according to this, uh, this aspect, is such that to be a lover or beloved is to have this kind of openness and willingness. Moreover, it is the love itself that supplies the reason for why a friend would be willing to say, for example, to read Russian literature. Because the beloved enjoys Russian literature, um, the, the, their recommendation that, that, that Russian literature is good is reason enough for the lover to start reading it. Now, almost all the examples given by Baltzley and Kennett involve openness to non-moral things and activities, like going bowling, seeing oneself as looking good in the color red, and so on. But the connection to mora morality is also clear. The lovers, through the process of mutual drawing, open themselves up to moral change, whether, of course, for the better or the worse, depends on the case. The second feature of love, which is defended by the philosopher Ward Jones, is the tendency for lovers to see each other as morally good. The idea is that, quote, to love someone involves a persistent expectation that she lives as a good person does, end of quote, and that loving, some, and that loving involves something like the desire that one's beloved be a good person and that she live a good life. This is a pervasive feature of love 
in that lovers typically think of themselves as being in love with good people. It is rare, actually, that a lover claims that their beloved is bad, and lovers tend to resist the admission by using various tactics, such as disbelief in, making light of, or explaining away the badness of the beloved. This does not mean that the lover's beliefs that her beloved is good are always true, only that lovers tend to think of, them, of their beloveds under such descriptions. Um, it's very rare that you find someone who's like, yeah, I fell in love with an evil person. You know, it's, that's, we usually put our, put our beloveds in the best moral light possible. The third feature of love, also from Ward Jones, is the idea of moral endorsement. So Jones claims that lovers morally endorse their beloveds. Quote, the lover vouches for his beloved with his belief that she is good and his placing his well-being, as it were, at her mercy, end of quote. So lovers not only tend to see their lovers as good, um, but they also, in being lovers, endorse their beloved's goodness. This endorsement occurs from, a com uh, occurs from a combination of the tendency to see their beloveds as good and incorporating the beloved's well-being with the lover's well-being. So in endorsing or vouching for the beloved's goodness, lovers put their own moral well-being at, sta at stake, so to speak. If the beloved acts wrongly, this reflects badly on the lover, which induces reflexive shame, as Jones says. The beloved, in acting wrongly, brings shame to the lover. This is a very interesting feature about love that I think Jones is uh, right about. The fourth feature is a descendant of the union theories of love, according to which the lovers somehow pool their identities or their well-beings uh, together. The, the famous essay on this is, by, of course, by Robert Nozick, which is called Love's Bond, and he uses in that essay the notion of the we as, the, as, the, as to refer to the union between the two. Now, because union theories face serious criticisms, Philosophers have tried to capture what is true about them while avoiding these criticisms. So, whereas on the third feature, there is no necessary connection between a lover's vouching for or endorsing his beloved's moral goodness and his adopting her values, um, <clears throat> Helm, Bennett Helm, uh, the famous philosopher and love also, Bennett Helm's account does have this strong feature. On Helm's view, love is intimate identification. Quote, loving someone involves valuing, what, involves valuing what she values for her sake, such that valuing is a mode of self-love in which one understands the thing valued to have a place within the kind of life worth one's, li worth one's li living. So to love someone, according to Helm, is to share the beloved's values for the beloved's sake and to endorse these values in a strong evaluative way. Not only uh, do they motivate the lover to act, but the lover makes them part of his life and part of his conception of the worthwhileness of his life. If these values are part of the identity of the beloved, then when the lover takes them up, he will share her identity. I will call this the adoption of the beloved's values. So on Helm's view, um, it's, the, it's a form of union view of love because according to him, the lover adopts the values of the beloved. They, he takes them on, basically. They become part of his own system of moral values. So all these features of, of, of morality and love can conflict with integrity, um, although the nature of the conflict is different with some than with others. So I will assume in what follows, uh, up until towards the end, that there are no mistaken integrities. Later, I will talk about mistaken integrities. But for now, I'm going to assume that all the examples I give are of integrities that are true, basically. So the first and second features of love contingently conflict with integrity. Under the first feature, the lover opens herself to being changed by the beloved, and although the change can be moral, it need not be. Under the second feature, the lover will tend to see the beloved as good, even if the beloved is not. But this need not involve a revision of the lover's own values. The reason for the contingent conflict is that both of these features are descriptive, so whether they apply depends on the case at hand. It is the third and fourth features that pose genuine threats to integrity, because under both of them, some sort of identification is going on between the lovers and the beloved's values, an identification that seems to be a necessary feature of love. When these values are opposed, the identification can rupture, can break. The lover would not be able to endorse the beloved's goodness, as in the third feature, or would not be able to adopt the beloved's values, as in the fourth feature. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give um, two detailed cases of how this can happen. Um, talk of maintaining one's integrity is easy when the discussion is at a very abstract level. 
we are all committed to justice, peace, and kindness, for example. And although this level of discussion allows us to handle some cases, fine-grained values and commitments are needed to think through more complex or realistic cases. So I'm going to give these two cases, both of which, by the way, are based on two um, relationships that I'm acquainted with, but of course, I, I, I don't use the people's real, real names. So consider first the case of Sandra and Kamal. Sandra and Kamal have been together for a good 10 years. Recently, Sandra had slowly changed her dietary regimen to become a veg vegetarian and then a vegan. Sandra has become a committed vegan because of animal welfare, although having some health advantages are uh, an additional plus. She has come to believe that animals, much like their human counterparts, have their own lives to lead and to flourish. So, so they are not resources of nutrition or medicine, let alone of pleasure for human beings. So to Sandra, our relationship with animals does not revolve merely around lessening or obliterating their suffering, but also about letting them be. In the case of animals in the wild, to let them live and die as nature prescribed, and in the case of farm animals, to stop breeding them for our purposes. These changes in her beliefs and habits have strained somewhat the practical aspect of Sandra's relationship with Kamal, but they were able to work things out. They have always alternated when it comes to cooking so that each cooks three times a week uh, with one night, say, going out for dinner, and Sandra did not at first have a problem cooking meat dishes for Kamal. Lately, however, she has been immersing herself more and more in the literature about and activism for veganism. And she has started finding herself less tolerant of people who eat meat and consume animal products. She started, and Kamal was happy to go along, changing all the household products to cruelty-free products. But Sandra has also started finding herself not wanting to cook meat dishes for Kamal, so she cooked only vegan meals. And more troublingly, when Kamal cooked a meat dish for himself, she started to find herself less able to be with him and watch him eat meat without thinking to herself that he is doing something deeply wrong. In addition, she has started to not be able to abide having meat in the, in the fridge or in the house in general. So they talk it through and Kamal is sympathetic to her concerns. He tells her that though he will not stop eating meat, he will make sure to buy it from ethical sources, such as local farms that treat their animals humanely until they are killed for meat. Sandra appreciates this, but has lingering concerns because she has doubts about the so-called humane treatment of animals and about killing them for their meat, especially since they are killed at a young age. To Sandra, death is a harm and a serious one at that when it comes at a young age. So killing a young animal for the taste of its meat is a clear moral wrong, and so is abetting this practice. Clearly, Sandra feels a conflict. She loves Kamal, but she also worries about what being with him means for her being vegan. The conflict she feels is between being vegan and being with a beloved who is not. She is motivated to act and shape her life by the values of veganism, but this acting and shaping are in tension with being motivated to endorse Kamal's goodness and adopt his values. Her moral reasons and her reasons of love are in conflict. Or, if we consider reasons of love to ultimately be moral reasons, then Sandra's conflict is between two sets of moral reasons. Now, one response to this case by, uh, of Sandra and Kamal is to shrug off the conflict and claim that many couples have to make compromises so that if Kamal is willing to eat and use only humanely sourced animal products, then Sandra's reasons for love ought to persuade her to compromise on her part and just drop the issue. Just let it be, basically. This, however, is an easy way out only because it targets the practical aspect of their relationship and does not go into the theoretical issues that create the conflict for Sandra. The issue here is not just compromising on how many nights a week to go out for a movie, but of how one can have an integrated self when two of its parts pull away from each other. To see this point clearly, change the case to a couple, X and Y, in which X buys products made by slaves. Now imagine Y having qualms about what this means to Y and to the relationship, given that Y is obviously against slavery. Would it do to compromise by saying that X can buy slave-made products, but only from places where slaves are treated humanely? No, of course not, because the issue is not practical, but concerns Y's ability to follow Y's moral compass while also loving X. The only reason why we would accept the compromise in Sandra's case is the social, and to my mind, the lamentable fact that we, do, we just do not take animals' lives seriously enough. 
And indeed, this is how Sandra thinks about it. So there is a conflict that goes beyond figuring out a workable arrangement for the two of them. It's a deeper conflict than practical uh, concerns. Let's flesh out the conflict just a little bit more. To Sandra, animal lives are intrinsically valuable, and she cannot see herself participating in the practice of exploiting them, no matter how humanely it is done. But she also has a difficult time accepting the fact that she is with someone who is willing to benefit from the exploitation of, anim of animals. In this regard, and unlike the relationships between co-workers, neighbors, roommates, and people who are neither strangers nor intimates, intimate relationships involve features such as adopting the beloved's values and endorsing the beloved's moral goodness. Lovers and friends like each other and enjoy each other's company because often the liking and the enjoyment occur against the backdrop of <clears throat> and are enhanced by the shared values that they have in common. I have a close relationship, for example, with my friend Betty, because like me, she loves and respects animals. I have a close relationship with Satya, because like me, she is committed to the Palestinian cause. And I have a close relationship with Jerome, because like me, he is committed to racial justice in America. Although lovers and friends need not share all their values together, having opposed values or commitments put a strain on their, puts a strain on their relationship. <clears throat> So my relationship with Seth is sometimes put to the test when his commitment to not invite some speakers to campus clashes with my commitment to expose our students to various ways of thinking. So going back to the four features of love that I have, that I have outlined earlier, note that Sandra's openness <clears throat> to Kamal might lead her to change her views on animals, and her tendency to see Kamal as a good person might be threatened to some extent by his continued eating of meat. I say to some extent because unless Sandra's view of Kemal is completely colored by his conception of animal products, Sa Sandra will continue to see Kemal as a good person in other aspects. Nonetheless, neither of these two features pose any obvious threat to her integrity. So for example, his lack of goodness as such is not connected to her integrity because she might foreclose change as far as animals are concerned. She will just say, I'm not gonna let that part affect me. And her tendency to see Kemal as not good has no bearing as such on her own integrity. If anything, these two features might prompt her to try to change Kamal to become vegan himself as a way of promoting his moral well-being. It is the other two features that I think threaten Sandra's integrity because they directly involve Sandra as Kamal's lover. If love requires that the lover endorse the moral goodness of the beloved, as according to Jones's view, it is unclear how Sandra can do this without violating her integrity. She cannot be committed to the welfare of animals while endorsing the moral goodness of someone, even if he is her beloved, who not only eats meat, but thinks that it is perfectly permissible to do so under certain conditions. More, more, more importantly, it is unclear how, according to Helm's view, Sandra can share and adopt Kamal's values as part of her own conception of her life without violating her integrity. So on both Jones's view and Helm's view, the clash between integrity and love are, 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 are clearest, basically. So in this case, the five conditions outlined in the, in, the, in the introduction to this presentation are satisfied. Sandra's integrity tracks real and worthwhile values. I have assumed this. Animal welfare is, is a crucial identity forming value to Sandra. Kamal has values contrary to those reflected in Sandra's integrity. Kamal acts on these values and Sandra cannot justify the beloved's values. <clears throat> given that early death is a serious harm to animals, given that this harm cannot justify the pleasures of eating meat, Kamal's view seems to be indefensible. So Sandra can do one of three things as far as her values and being with Kamal are concerned. She can set her qualms aside, turn a blind eye to them. She can revise her values on animals, or she can just stop being with Kamal. She can, she can break up with her, basically. <clears throat> Put aside the actual ability to pull off any one of these three options. Assume also that Sandra's values are true, that she's right to value what she does about animals then each of the three options is going to leave Sandra morally compromised. The first option requires a violation of her integrity insofar as turning a blind eye to being with Kamal is a failure to live up to her ideals. It severs the ties between what she believes and values and her actions. She would be willing to not only tolerate, but to actively allow herself to love, care, support, comfort, make happy, someone whose actions help maintain a practice that is morally abhorrent by her own standards. The second option requires a revision of her values, which in some cases is the right thing to do if one's values were mistaken, but which in Sandra's case, I am assuming are not. 
Note here that the process by which a lover decides to revise or not to revise her values need not ex exclude the beloved. Sandra, for example, owes it to Kamal and to herself to discuss the issue, not only with an eye to changing his or her mind, but out of epistemic and moral openness to another, especially another who is her beloved. The point regarding the second option, however, is not so much about the process of revision as much as it is about the cost of the revision, given that the revision would mean <clears throat> changing Sandra's correct values. The third option keeps Sandra's integrity intact, and it conforms with what integrity requires, standing up for her beliefs. It confirms not only that integrity is a personal matter, something inside Sandra and between her and herself, concerning the coherence among her values, motives, and actions, but also that it is about a worthwhile matter for which Sandra is willing to take a public stance. Uh, <clears throat> it is an issue of importance and sticking by it demonstrates to others, Kamal, friends, family, and so on, that Sandra is a person of integrity. The price of the third option, however, is high. She loses Kamal, basically. Uh, had her relationship with him been in its early stages, dissolving it might not be very harmful to both or involve an injustice to Kamal, given that the relationship is young. But given that they have been together for 10 years, the dissolution is potentially seriously harmful to both because of the emotional, practical, and social toll it would take on them. It might also be unfair to Kamal, given the length of the relationship and given that Sandra's veganism was acquired later. <clears throat> so whichever option Sandra chooses, she will be morally compromised. The second case is about Kyle and Denise. Kyle and Denise have been together for a good 10 years. <clears throat> Denise studied philosophy as an undergraduate and took many courses in ethics and applied ethics, her favorite subjects, and has come to have an articulate and well-supported view about the wrongness of abortion. Kyle used to be non-committal about abortion and mostly just agreeing with Denise and going along with what she thinks. Lately, however, he has started immersing himself more in the literature and activism about abortion, and he has started to form his own beliefs about it. Kyle has come to believe that although fetuses are potential human beings, as Denise believes, at early stages they are more accurately described as clumps of human cells. So killing them is permissible. Besides, and having read the famous essay by Judith Jarvis Thompson, he reasons that even if fetuses are persons and so have a right to life, this does not mean that they have a right to their mother's bodies. Unless the mother invites them to the use of her body, no such right exists. More troublingly, <clears throat> Kyle has started to be less tolerant of people who believe that abortion is wrong. And he has started to believe that they are anti-feminist and anti-women. He now finds himself less able to listen to Denise talk about abortion without thinking to himself that she is terribly mistaken about this issue and that her mistaken beliefs, not to mention her skewed values, are complicit in harm to women. This has put some strain on their relationship in that they tend to clash whenever the topic comes up, um, including when they are with other friends and family members, some of whom are pro-choice and others of whom are say, are say are against abortion. So they have come to try, so they try to avoid the subject. <clears throat> they talk it through, however, and Denise is sympathetic to his concerns. She tells Kyle that though she is unlikely to believe that abortion is permissible, she reminds him that first, she is not politically active when it comes to abortion. She does not protest at abortion clinics or vote merely on the candidate's views about the issue, for example. Second, she reminds him that she does not deny the moral permissibility of abortion when the mother's life is in danger. Third, she believes that pregnant women should receive whatever support they need to go through with the pregnancy so as to assure them, as much as assurances here can be offered, that the child will be given a good home. And fourth, she tells Kyle that her view is defensible. Although she can see describing a fetus as a clump of cells, she can also reasonably describe it as a human embryo that will develop into a human being if given the chance. <clears throat> Clearly, Kyle feels a conflict. He loves Denise, but he also worries about what being with her means for him being pro-choice, as we call it here in the United States. The conflict he feels is between his being pro-choice and being with a beloved who is not. It is, between being for, it is between being for the rights of women to bodily autonomy and between being with a beloved who believes that these rights are trumped by other rights, are overridden by other rights. He is motivated to act and shape his life by these values, but this acting and shaping are in tension with being motivated to endorse Denise's goodness and adopt her values. His moral reasons and his reasons of love are in conflict. 
or if we consider reasons of love to ultimately be moral ones, then Kant's conflict is between two sets of moral reasons. Again, one easy way out is to claim that many couples have to make compromises so that if Denise's views about abortion are well supported, then surely Carl's reasons of love ought to persuade him to compromise on his part and just drop the issue. Again, however, just as in the case of Sandra and Kamal, this way out targets the practical aspect of their relationship and does not go into the theoretical issues that create the conflict for Kyle. Kyle's case, however, <clears throat> is importantly different from Sandra's. First, Denise, unlike Kamal, who eats meat and consumes animal products, is not actively partaking in any practice that indirectly or directly causes harm to women, or for that matter, benefits embryos. Denise's beliefs about abortion remain confined to beliefs. At most, Denise might, through discussions and conversations about this issue, persuade others of her view, and the new converts might, in turn, end up causing harm to women if they decide to act on their newly adopted beliefs. But the probability of all this occurring is so low that it would implausibly morally condemn most of us for doing harm and being responsible for others' actions. Second, unlike Sandra's inability to defend Kamal's beliefs about the permissibility of humanely killing animals at a young age for the taste of their meat, Kyle can reason in the following way. Denise's beliefs about abortion, like some other issues, are not indefensible, which affects what it means for Kyle to maintain his integrity when he is with Denise who holds an opposing view. This aspect of the issue allows Kyle to be able to endorse Denise's moral goodness. Yes, he disagrees with her on an important issue, but he can also see the reasonableness of her view and he knows that moral considerations, such as compassion for would-be babies, motivate her to hold it. So in this case, not all of the four conditions outlined in the introduction of this presentation are satisfied. Although Kyle's integrity tracks real and worthwhile values, Although women's welfare and autonomy are identity-forming values to Kyle, and although Denise has values contrary to those reflected in Kyle's integri integrity, Denise does not act on her values, and Kyle can justify them. Given that human life is important, and given that women are afforded a place in Denise's value system, Kyle finds Denise's view to be defensible. He disagrees with it, but his disagreement does not block his ability to endorse Denise's goodness, though he cannot adopt those specific values of hers. Kyle, like Sandra, can do one of three things as far as his values and being with Denise are concerned. He can force himself to set his doubts aside, revise his values on abortion, or not be with Denise. Kyle's ability to portray Denise's values as defensible, however, allows him to take the first option. He can set aside his qualms that he loves someone whose values are wrong or abhorrent. These are not going to be true in his case. Kyle then need not take the second or third option. Both the cases of Sandra and Kyle <clears throat> hinge, depend on three crucial points. On, first, on the incompatibility between some of the lover's values and some of the beloved's regarding an issue. Second, on the centrality of the lover's values to his or her moral identity. And third, on the lover's ability to, de to depict the beloved's values as morally defensible which allows the lover to set them aside and thus be able to endorse the goodness of the beloved. The first <clears throat> is true of both cases in that some of the values of each partner about a specific issue cannot both be true. The second is also true of both cases. Each of Sandra and Kyle views their values about animals and abortion respectively as central to their moral identity. The two cases differ on the third point. Sandra, for good, for good reason, is unable to render Kamal's values defensible as far as animals are concerned, whereas Kyle is able to render Denise's values defensible as far as abortion is concerned. I will say more at the end about the ability of justifying the beloved's values. But for now, one might wonder why Kyle has to be able to justify Denise's values if Denise does not act on them. If Denise, the idea is that if Denise does not act on those values, where is the difficulty? And the difficulty is, is stems from the, the requirement of being able to endorse the beloved's goodness. For someone's goodness does not consist only of their actions, but also of their beliefs and values. For Kyle to be able to endorse Denise as a good person, he needs to be able to justify her values regarding women's limits on bodily autonomy. Note in this regard a twist in the Kamal and Sandra case. Assume that Kamal not only is convinced of Sandra's views about animals, but that he shares them. 
It's just that he has a hard time not eating meat because he is often in situations, cultural, traditional, in which he needs to eat meat. Sandra should not have then a difficult time endorsing his goodness because then in this type of case, she would realize that his actions reflect not so much his values, but other things, such as the necessity for cultural conformity. Sandra, in that kind of case, can cut Kamal some, some slack. So both actions and values matter for the protection of integrity. It's not just the actions. So now I come to the part about mistaken integrities and mistaken defenses. <clears throat> I have been discussing integrity and love from a moral psychological view, explaining cases of conflict from the point of view of those who experience them, while assuming that their experiences reflect true values and proper, re and proper reasoning. Consider now the case given by Dirk Balsley and Jeanette Kennett, the one that I alluded to earlier. The case is as follows. Jim and Tammy are a married Christian couple. They believe that a woman's place is in the home, taking care of her husband and children. Now that the children have grown up, however, Tammy has a change of mind <clears throat> about her role and decides to take a part-time job. Jim has a hard time with this, and he feels a conflict between his love for Tammy and his integrity, because his moral commitments prevent him from being able to set aside his qualms about what Tammy wants to do, let alone being able to adopt her new values. Here, there is divergence between a subjective and objective conflict between love and integrity. Jim perceives a threat to his integrity where there is none. Let us assume what is obviously true, that Jim is wrong to believe that a woman's place is at home. Then, contrary to what he thinks, his integrity is not in any actual danger from his love to Tammy, because he ought to revise his views about women's roles and therefore ought to rethink his values and commitments. Of course, he thinks that his integrity is threatened, but that is only because he has mistaken values about the role of women. The threat in this case is not to Jim's integrity, but from his perceived integrity to his love for and relationship with Tammy. Unlike Sandra's and Kyle's cases, Jim's values are not anchored in or mirrored by objective moral facts. The case of Jim illustrates the difference between the actual values of some people and hence how their integrity reflects them on the one hand and on the other, which values they should have and hence how their integrity should reflect them. Although Jim has values about the role of women, they are incorrect values. He should revise them, which implies a revision in his integrity. Note that the force of the should applies not only to the values one should have, but also to the importance that they should have for the person in question. Imagine Rabab, a woman who cares about a moral issue, but with undue emphasis, such as consider the example. So suppose she is passionate, for example, about the depiction or lack, lack thereof of Arab characters in science fiction. If Rabab, if she refuses to love someone or considers leaving someone who thinks that although it would be good to have more Arab characters in science fiction, Really, this is not an issue worth too much moral energy. Rabab seems to have placed undue emphasis on this particular value. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this case is that sometimes someone can have um, a moral commitment to something that is not false, like in the case of Jim, but not as worthy as somebody might think, so that if it competes with love, the person might be giving the wrong weight in, the, in that kind of case. So let's return to Jim and Tammy. Jim is unable to justify Tammy's values regarding the place of women in the workplace, which blocks his ability to endorse her goodness or share her values. Jim's inability indicates the dangers of justifying the beloved's values by the lover, for the lover's views are likely to affect the lover's perception of his ability to pull off this justification. Jim believes that Tammy's values are indefensible, whereas they are defensible. There is a tension between a perceived and a real ability to justify the beloved's values. Even Sandra's and, and Kyle's abilities can come under scrutiny because one can argue that Sandra's inability to justify Kamal's values is due to her philosophical blindness to say accounts of death that do not see death as a harm, like the Epicurean account. And Kyle's ability to justify Denise's values is due to his not taking what women go through seriously enough. In short, the line between the ability and the inability to justify another's values is fuzzy, and for various reasons, including the lovers not canvassing all the justifications that can be, that exist, and the lovers not putting sufficient weight on some values. So I fully grant the fuzziness, and I think its existence, however, pervades all our moral reasoning, not just when it comes to integrity. 
because people often rationalize bad things to make them good, fall epistemically short in many ways, are influenced by very various biases, and so on. So the best we can hope for is that lovers reason their way through their beloved's values as well as possible, especially knowing that what is at stake, love and integrity, are crucial values themselves. So now I'm in the concluding section, so um, which is um, philosophy and reality, as I call it. I have argued that given some features of love and integrity, a lover's integrity is endangered by love when her integrity's values are real and worthwhile, when her integrity is crucial to her moral identity, when the beloved has values contrary to those reflected by her integrity, when her beloved acts on those beloved's values, and when the lover cannot defend her beloved's values, which blocks her ability to endorse the beloved's moral goodness. How the lover should act in cases of conflict, however, I left as an open question. Though no matter which option the lover takes, there will likely be a heavy price. Of the various reasons for why people terminate relationships, for example, a new love, falling in love with someone new, unhappiness, boredom, abuse, betrayal, irreconcilable differences, as we say sometimes, we don't hear of much of integrity. And usually, you rarely hear of someone saying, I, I left so-and-so because I wanted to preserve my integrity. It's, it's, it, you hear it, but it's not as common as the other reasons that are given. And although we do hear of the related concepts of dignity and self-respect, they tend to refer to the lover's unwillingness to continue to be treated badly by the beloved. Rarely do they refer to the lover's moral values about things external to the relationship. In other words, when some people say, I left a relationship because I wanted to preserve my dignity, that usually means because the beloved was being treated badly by the, by the other person in the relationship. It's very rare that we say things like, I decided to leave so-and-so because my values do not comport with his values. Indeed, we all know of couples who deeply love each other and who have successful relationships, yet who differ on various moral issues, such as animal rights, rights of sexual and gender minorities, nation building, wars, the role of government in social issues, and so on. The existence of such cases raises interesting questions for this essay's argument. Sorry, for this presentation's argument. Are conflicts between love and integrity simply uncommon? If yes, why? Is it because people tend to have successful relationships only with those who share their values? Is it because the argument that I have pursued in this presentation is too philosophically stuffy? Is it like some philosophical accounts too sophisticated for reality or too, too, too far apart from reality? Or is it because people's integrity is just not dear enough to them, especially in the face of worthy and powerful potential competitors like love and friendship? I mean, who can compete with love, right? Barring some difficult to pull off empirical work, I can only speculate. But I confess that I often wonder about the realism of some philosophical accounts of love. For example, does not Bennett Helm's idea of adopting the beloved's values raise the bar very high for most lovers? Why can lovers not adopt some of their beloved's values? Why is adoption even necessary? Why is it not enough that they accept or even tolerate their beloved's values? And as far as Jones's account is concerned, must the endorsement of the goodness of the beloved be complete or can it be partial? Um, <clears throat> I am sympathetic to these rhetorical questions. Although lovers typically view their beloveds as good, even when the latter have moral shortcomings, even when the beloveds have moral shortcomings, it might be that they are able to do so by endorsing the beloved's goodness holistically or in general. That is, in other words, they might not be blind to the beloved's moral defects, but they might also see that the beloved has other properties that compensate for the defects. And perhaps love is this sight or vision, as Lord Johnny Moore calls it, which is the ability to love someone, endorse and vouch for their moral goodness without being blind to their moral defects. Though whether they accept, tolerate, or try to change the defects depends on the case. So the adoption of a beloved's values need not be complete and can be partial. And the endorsement need not be absolute, and it can be holistic. However, I do want to caution that if we pursue this line of thinking, we are on thin ice. When is a holistic endorsement of the beloved's goodness compatible or incompatible with a lover's integrity? Surely there are moral defects for which no good moral qualities can compensate. 
thereby blocking the endorsement. Imagine loving a pedophile, a killer, a rapist, a torturer. Imagine loving someone racist, a supporter of ethnic cleansing, a cruel pimp, a sex trafficker. If the lovers are not, at the very least, troubled by their beloved's moral actions, given uh, their avowed commitments, we would rightly wonder how integrated their values are with each other and with their actions and motives. We would doubt their integrity, that is. <clears throat> so lovers' ability to maintain their integrity depends on their ability to endorse their beloveds as good people, despite their beloveds having some moral defects. In those cases in which such defects morally clash with the lover's values. The issue is going to be which moral defects and in which contexts are minor enough and which are major enough to respectively allow and block the endorsement without endangering the lover's integrity. The possibility of making mistakes here is huge. If lovers tend to see their beloveds as good to begin with, and if lovers are open to change by their beloveds, then rationalizing away a beloved's serious moral defect is an ever-present danger to the lover's integrity. Perhaps Kyle is committing this error. On the other hand, lovers have to be careful to not enlarge a beloved's moral defect to the point of not being able to endorse the beloved as good. Perhaps Sandra commits this error. So, thinking of love and integrity together raises, I think, fascinating questions. In this presentation, I have barely scratched the surface. For example, I have not even canvassed some other types of interesting cases, such as those involving moral lapses. For example, <coughs> imagine that both Sandra and Kamal have been vegans, but that Kamal relapses to eating meat. But in I hope to have opened the door for some interesting discussion and for future thinking on this topic. Thank you so much. Well, difficult stuff, <laughs> difficult questions. Well, I, I will start the, the Q&A with, uh, with a question by Isadora. Here we are. What are the harms of putting the feeling of love and satisfaction against your ideals and values, one thing justify the other? Um, what are the harms of putting the feeling of love and satisfaction against your ideal values? One thing justifies the other. I'm not sure I understand the second part, but on my view, I think if there is a genuine clash between the two, then the harm is a moral harm. Um, so here the question of harm is a little bit tricky because sometimes we think of harms as being things that we feel for, or that we experience, such as, for example, um, so losing money or being hit on the head or something like that. But not all harms are of this nature. Some harms are harms to our interests and to the way we want to think of ourselves. So if there is a genuine clash between, uh, is between, between the, the, the beloved's values and our integrity, the harm is to our moral picture of ourselves, basically. We tend to see ourselves um, as being moral beings, but we are actually not being moral beings. And by the way, this can be true even if the person is not actually thinking of it this way. So one can harm one's moral integrity even if one is not aware of this harm, basically. I have a question uh, I think is in the same vein as Isadora's questions. Uh, well, in other two previous moments of this event in, in Luke Bruning's talk and Professor Alina's discussion of bell hooks, the, the same idea came up. It, it, it uh, was also came up now. And, and the idea is of an active role for love. And love is defined as uh, equalization between moral values of the people involved. Lovers are on the same page. But, and my question is whether we can really connect love and moral integrity uh, without sharing very basic moral values. No? Whether, whether we can uh, connect m love and moral integrity without sharing any value, without sharing any values in common. Um, so that could be, but I think, so let me put it this way. One of the things that I have done in the presentation is to try to show how on some accounts of love, there's going to be a serious clash between love and integrity. Whether love and integrity, so whether, whether two people can love each other um, without sharing moral values with each other is going to really depend at the end on what our conception of love is. And this is the tricky part, right? Defining love and coming up with a, with a, with a plausible conception of love can be quite tricky and can be quite difficult. 
So if you look at certain views like War, like Jones's view and Helm's view, right, they have such strong conceptions of love, right, that um, they require that require the lovers to adopt basically or share their values, right. In which case you're going to have a genuine conflict. Now you can come up with another conception of love that doesn't have this kind of strong requirement, right? In which case you can say, well, then they can coexist with each other. The danger there, however, the danger there, however, is going to be whether the conception of love that you come up with is strong enough to characterize as to be to be genuine love. In other words, it's it, it, it you have to make sure that there are so here's one way to think about it. One of the things that we that one of the things that we th one of the things that is generally thought to be true about love is that it involves some sort of, some kind of union, and I know union is a very strong term, right? But that it involves some sort of bond between the two lovers, basically. Whether you want to call this union, shared identity, as Robert Solomon calls it, whatever you want to call it, there's going to be some sort of bond that's involved. So whatever conception of love you want to give, it has to be a conception that is, that is true to this idea, right? Um, and so does not dilute love to the point that it becomes something just just the ju ju juxtaposition of two people together or two people just having sex with each other or two people just spending their lives with each other, while at the same time allowing for no shared moral values. So that's going to be the tricky part on this. On this. Great. Well, I, I need to think to, 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 to say something about marriage. Yeah. And uh, the, I have another question is... It's connected with uh, the, the previous one. Uh, isn't marriage one of the most suitable places for us to reveal your moral values, putting your values in balance with the values of your partners? And may, maybe the, the, the idea of marriage as a, a lab for her, for change. Right? Um, <clears throat> so it, again, it depends. <laughs> I know I sound, I'm, I'm sounding very evasive here, but it depends a lot. <laughs> How we it depends on how we think of marriage, right? So, under certain conceptions of marriage, basically, the under certain perhaps contemporary or or uh, or um, modern conceptions of marriage, right? Marriage just is this conception where two two people come together and it's like a laboratory, right? But then marriage seems to be just another way of saying love, basically, right? So which takes us back to our original question oh. or the earlier question that you asked, Eduardo. But um, under previous conceptions of marriage, there is no such, there is no, there is no temptation to think of marriage this way. In in most marriages throughout history, marriages have been done for political alliances. They have been done for economic reasons to pool sources to to, to pull together sources to have children who are going to be economic uh, power power horses basically for the family. Um, and and you know it's a very well known fact about marriage that you know in the past or in some cultures. To say that you want to get married for love, you can be laughed at basically because nobody get, gets married for such for such silly reasons as people as as is, as was commonly said in the past. So, it, so again, if we think of marriage along the romantic conception of marriage that people should marry for love and so on and so forth, that just takes us back to the question that we asked earlier: Is it possible for two people to be in love with each other and say not share values and so on and so forth? So, yeah. Okay. Well, I have a last question. It's more general. Uh, in a way, I think it's fair to say that you have helped to shape a field of contemporary philosophical, uh, philosophical inquiry uh, with your publications on the topics of sex and love. Uh, can you tell, tell us uh, a little uh, about the attraction of these topics in the North American academic environment? Um. That's a, that's a that's a that's a that's a tough question. Um, I think one of so I think one of the reasons why we are attracted to it is because well for one thing well it depends if we're talking about sex or love and they're quite different things right. Well, I think one of the reasons why we're attracted to philosophy of sex is because it's about sex and sex is always attractive. People always like to talk about sex. They like to joke about sex. They like to you know they find it titillating and whatever. There are all these reasons. Another reason is because. Historically speaking, in philosophy, especially in the Western world, but I think it's true to a large extent to the, in the non-Western world, um, philosophical discussions have not addressed sex and love very much. They haven't treated it. I mean, even Aristotle. I mean, Plato, of course, is famous because he has the symposium. He has a, the, the, the Phaedrus, and, uh, uh, um, and he has some other dialogues in which he discusses it. But 
Um, Aristotle, for example, in his Nicomachean Ethics, doesn't talk about love, doesn't talk about sex. He has, he has, he talks about friendship, which is great, um, but he doesn't talk about love. He doesn't talk about sex. In in his discussion of temperance, which is the virtue about bodily pleasures, Aristotle seems to have in mind the pleasure of eating, not the pleasure of sex. <clears throat> so, and since then, of course, we had the Christian uh, obsession with sex and you know the banishment of sex to the role of marriage and so on and so forth. So there have been very few discussions of it. So some of the interest in it could be attributable to a kind of first, a kind of dearth in the field, in the discussion of the field that led philosophers to to um, to discuss it a lot with with a lot of with a lot of hunger, so to speak. So I use first on hunger. A third reason, of course, is the connection to feminist philosophy because we have in the Western world, certainly over the last, what, 60, 70 years, we have had an explosion among philosophers in thinking about feminist issues, right? About women's rights and so on and so forth with the first wave feminism, second wave feminism, third wave feminism. And of course, whenever you talk about women's issues, the notion of love and sex, the notions of love and sex are not far behind because almost maybe 60%, 70% of the issues having to do with women, with women have to do with the notions of objectification, the relegation of women to reproduction, the relegation of women to being the passive parties in love, and so on and so forth. So that the discussion of sex and love is, is, a, natural, is a natural alignment with the, last, with, the, with, the, with the previous discussions of feminism. So that's a third reason for it. So I think these three reasons might account. There's obviously, of course, a fourth reason, which is that the, interest, the topics are themselves very interesting. I mean, there are certain philosophical questions about sex and love that are just fascinating. You know, I mean, uh, for example, the, the question about love, whether we love someone because of their properties or, for, or, or we love them first and then we value their properties, which comes first, the chicken or the egg in this case. And of course, every answer, each answer to the question is not going to be satisfactory because each answer has its own problems to deal with. So there are some ever increasing, and of course, we've had this question since Plato's Symposium. It's, it's, been, in the, it's been in there with Diotima's Dio, Dio account of love. Um, so it's a fascinating field in and of itself. So I think, so I think those four reasons are good. I'm sure there are more, but I think these four are, are going to be part of the story. <clears throat> great, great, Professor. Well, I'd like to thank you for the, the talk, as well as everyone who was with us during this four days. Well, and see you next year. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Take care. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.